In the last episode, a devastating plague nearly wiped out my ant colonies. But the remaining survivors are not out of the woods yet. Winter is coming. And if they aren't prepared for hibernation in time, it could be the end of my carpenter ants. This is the story of my ants' race against the clock to ready themselves for the long nap looming ahead and the exciting arrival of something new which will change everything. Welcome to the story of the ants, part six. If you've been enjoying this series and I've earned your appreciation, hit like and subscribe for more content like this. Now back to the story. Let's start by checking in on the state of each colony after the tragic event that killed many of my ants, including my favorite colony, the Minions of Midas. This was likely caused by either an apple that I fed them containing pesticides, or flea oil left on my hands after petting my dog, then handling their food. First up, they're the Antarchists, a sort of failed colony of Mexican honeypot ants that lost their queen. Their numbers have continued to dwindle since the event, to the point where, once all of their brood develop, their colony will consist entirely of just four feisty rebels. Then, there are the gumdrops, my colony of half-red honeypot ants who weren't poisoned like the others, but suffered their own series of unfortunate deaths. I'm learning now that this could be stress-related, and that honeypots are more sensitive than other species while the colony is still small. They are now down to just four workers, a pile of larvae, and their queen. They haven't been very active since I got them, and shown little interest in food or protein for the brood. Finally, there are the golden galleons, my beloved carpenter ants who were hit the hardest. This colony was reduced to just the queen and a single worker. Thankfully, they do have some brood, which I've seen the last worker diligently tending to. There is a chance that the larvae were also poisoned by food passed on from affected workers. But at least I know that these two pupa are safe since they don't eat during that stage of development. Think of it like a caterpillar cocoon butterfly situation. The larva eat a bunch of food and protein to grow. Then as a pupa, it's just focused on transforming its body into an ant. I'm hoping these two cocoons hatch soon because their clock is ticking. You see, most species undergo a type of hibernation in the winter called diapause. As winter approaches, queens will stop laying eggs while workers lose interest in finding protein for the brood. They'll instead stock up on sugars to sustain them through winter, causing the larva to pause development and enter a dormant state. As temperatures continue to drop, many species even produce an antifreeze in their bodies to keep from freezing solid. Isn't that amazing? Now, you might be thinking, do ants really need to hibernate to endure the cold, harsh, and unforgiving winters of San Diego? Which is a fair question but it actually doesn't matter what temperature it is outside. Diapause is a part of their natural biological clock, and if you don't allow them to do so by keeping them awake in a warm space, it can negatively affect the health and lifespan of the colony. Imagine not sleeping all weekend, then trying to go to work on Monday. You're not gonna feel good, nor is it good for you. So, ant keepers will hibernate their ants in a wine fridge at around 50 degrees Fahrenheit from November to March. Now, the galleons have already been showing signs that they're preparing for diapause. Aunt Bonnie hasn't laid any new eggs in a while, and the worker hasn't shown much interest in the protein that I've been offering. Putting them into hibernation is certainly not ideal with the colony being so small. So I sought the advice of a more experienced ant keeper who recommend waiting until the end of November to give the pupa a chance to hatch. Because while larvae can go dormant, Eggs and pupa usually don't survive diapause. Therefore, Aunt Bonnie and her first mate have some work to do before they can be put in the fridge. Since this worker now has such an important role, I decided to give her the name Mary Reed. For reference, Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed were history's most infamous duo of female pirates during the golden age of piracy. I keep the ants on a shelf by my desk so I can check on their activity throughout the day. Mary will typically bring the brood out over the heat mat where it's warm and just babysit them for hours. But then I'll catch glimpses of something I've only managed to capture on camera once. Aunt Bonnie will wander out, pick up the brood, and take it back into the nest. This would happen multiple times a day. Mary would be out with the brood, then Aunt Bonnie would come along and bring them back in. Mary would then take them back out, and Aunt Bonnie would steal them away again. 
It's like they were having an ongoing squabble about how to raise the children. I've never seen anything like it before. So while we let them work that out, I do have some news to share with you. Even though our beloved Queen Midas could never be replaced, that's exactly what I did. I actually got my hands on another colony of Campanotis CA02. Now, why would I do that? Well, the reign of Queen Midas was tragically cut short before we could see her kingdom's full glory. So I figured this way, her legacy could be carried on by a successor. This is Queen Midas II, and she will be inheriting the throne for the minions of Midas. This species is just too fascinating to let go of. Their coloration alone is beautiful, but their size is what's truly impressive. As the largest Campanotis species in the US, the queens range from 21 to 24 millimeters, or almost an inch, and can live up to 15 years. They are also a polymorphic species, meaning multiple forms. So, once the colony's big enough, the queen will start producing majors that can be almost as big as she is. Taking a closer look, you can tell that they're ready for diapause. Their booties look like big green Christmas lights from filling up on green sugar water for the long winter ahead. There were also no eggs to be found anywhere in the tube, only a single larva being held by this worker. So, I asked my in-laws the very normal request if I could keep ants in their wine fridge for a few months. I'm sure they had a good laugh over that one. I am truly the nerdy son they never had. First, we brought the fridge up to room temperature. Then after reading them several bedtime stories and tucking them in, I gently placed them in the bottom rack. Each day, we gradually reduced the temperature so they could acclimate. Even though I know this is what the ants need, it still feels weird leaving them in here and makes me a little nervous since I've never done this before. Good luck, minions of Midas. We will see you in the spring. The next day, I made a sad discovery. Mary Reed didn't make it. She was a fighter though and lasted 11 days longer than the others, carrying out her duties until the very end. This certainly raises the stakes for Aunt Bonnie. Without workers, a queen must rely solely on her own reserves for survival, which is significantly more challenging before winter without the resource management that a colony provides. It's now more crucial than ever that these two pupa develop, and there are only three weeks left until December 1st. The days start to pass by, and she needs to be bulking up on sugars, but she doesn't seem too interested, which makes me wonder if she's already trying to go into diapause. Not yet, girl. We need you awake a little longer, so drink up. I'm not sure whether this is good or bad, but I noted that the pupa are looking more wrinkled than before. There was now just over a week left in November, so I continued offering both sugar and protein. It looks like this time some of the nectar was gone, but I still couldn't tell if she drank it or if the water evaporated. She had moved the fruit fly into the other dish though, so at least she knows that it's there. It was now November 28th, with only a few days left until December 1st. I went to check and ah! She was stuck in the nectar. Shoot, I had left the nectar for too long and it dried up and became a sticky glob. She's probably been like this all night too. Dang, I had to get her out of there. So I diluted the nectar with a couple drops of water, which allowed her to pull herself free. Phew. I'm glad she was out. But now, I was worried if this incident would cause other problems. For one, this probably induced a lot of stress, which is dangerous for single queens. Second, she was now covered in nectar without workers to clean her, introducing a risk of bacteria, or simply getting stuck in the cotton from being sticky. Thankfully, the next day she was okay. But at this point, I was starting to question whether or not the pupa were even still alive. I noticed that the cocoons looked more shriveled and darker than they used to. Just when I was starting to think they may have died, I caught this. Right there. Did you see it move? It's alive! It's alive! We are so close now. And hold up. Do you see what I see? She laid a new cluster of eggs. <laughs> Normally, this would be great news, but girl, it's a bit too late for that. At any rate, the colony won't let that protein go to waste and will recycle the eggs in time. A couple weeks later, and December 1st had come and gone. Aunt Bonnie is now officially up past her bedtime. 
but she is finally hanging out by the food dish, drinking the nectar, which was a relief. I keep checking on the cocoons, thinking they'll emerge any day now. I mean, look at them. I can see all of their features, antenna, and legs. Come on, little buddies. You can sleep for like three months straight after this, but first you need to come out, eat a bunch of sugar, and take care of your queen. The next couple days, I noticed that she was spending most of her time on the other side of the test tube, away from the brood, but I wasn't sure why. Her behavior started changing too. She seemed more agitated, and I even caught her scratching at the tube and flipping onto her back. That's when I realized I had probably been checking on her too frequently because I wanted to catch the pupa emerging on camera. What she needed now was to be left alone for several days in a dark, quiet environment. I figured this will allow her a chance to settle down, give the workers time to a close, and then I can feed them a big meal before putting them into diapause for the winter. And that brings us to the present moment. Seriously, at this point in the story, you have caught up to what I've written in the script, and here we are, staring at the box. I have been on the edge of my seat for the last five days, wondering what happens next, and we're about to find out together. No. This was not how the story was supposed to go. Aunt Bonnie was supposed to be the prevailing survivor that beat the odds, revived the colony, went into diapause, only to emerge next spring stronger than ever with a new crew at her command. But alas, a difficult realization I've had to accept since making these videos is that I can embellish the presentation of the story, but I do not get the luxury of crafting the plot. Okay, so what did we learn? First off, I was checking on her way too often. Therefore, I believe stress is ultimately what killed her. So as much as I wanted to monitor her progress every day, I should have put her back in the box for a week at a time once Mary Reed passed on. As for what happened to the pupa, I learned that their cocoons need to be opened by other workers or the queen, as shown in this video by Ants Canada. Maybe Aunt Bonnie thought the task of opening the pupa's cocoons was still no longer her responsibility, and it just didn't register to her that there were no more workers left to do so. We're working with an ant brain, after all. Remember how she started hanging out on the other end of the test tube, which was strange? My guess is that the pupa died from not being able to get out of their cocoons, then began decomposing, which is why she was keeping her distance. It's hard not to feel like I completely failed my first year of ant keeping. I lost all of my original queens, the gumdrops have been randomly dying off, and two other colonies I haven't even revealed on this channel yet have also been losing workers. I actually have more than enough content of just the gumdrop shenanigans during this time period to fill an entire episode. If they make a comeback, I'll tell you the full story. But for now, just know that I'm doing everything I can to help them bounce back. Without any healthy colonies to show for all my time and hard work, it's had me questioning whether or not I should even continue keeping ants. But then I remembered this clip from an interview Ants Canada did with John Yi from Just Ants. You might fail during the first few tries. You might get upset if your queen passes on or if your colony fails to establish. Never, you know, give up, you know, keep trying. I'm learning now that this is just kind of part of the process of learning this hobby. I've been so encouraged by all of the feedback, validation, and support that I've received from everyone in the comments. It seems like I am far from the only one that has lost their colonies from events both in and outside their control. The difference is that I like to get people emotionally invested in my little experiments by giving them names and heartfelt stories. No, this is not the end. After giving it some thought, I believe that there are more stories to be told, with new characters that will rise to glory. I think that the best stories are yet to come, and that this year will bring more exciting adventures. In fact, I already have plans in the works for future episodes, which I'm excited to show you. But you'll just have to wait until next time, as the story of the ants marches on.